Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, from me, Guy Munson, to our regular six-minute strategy summary. I'll be broadcasting every two weeks out into 2021, with, of course, a special broadcast if policy changes or a particular world event occurs. Watch out, too, for our new thematic videos, which will be, mo which will be filling some of those gaps uh, through, the, through, the, through the year. It's been an extraordinary three weeks since we last spoke. World markets up by about 3.5%. The UK and emerging markets up nearly 5% as a global reflationary impulse throws through the world economy, despite the daunting infection data we're now seeing in the Europe and the, U in the UK. Three particular events, we signed the Brexit deal, the advent of the new Astra vaccine, Astra Oxford vaccine, uh, regulated in the UK now, and thirdly, um, the Georgia elections, giving Biden control of the Senate, Congress and the House, a more reflationary agenda a new fiscal impulse. What does this mean for world markets? Will the bond market sound the alarm? And can this extraordinary surge in retail investment flows continue? That's what I'll be looking at in the next five minutes. Let's look first at the performance of markets in 2020, an extraordinary divergence between asset prices rising almost universally and the world economy suffering one of its sharpest downturns since the Second World War, and the UK oh, arguably its sharpest downturn in 300 years. Gold up 21%, global equities up an extraordinary 13%, UK gilts up 8%. On top of that, we had gains from infrastructure, commodities, hedge funds, domestic real estate. The list goes on. Equity volatility down to just 22.7 on the VIX at last night's close. By contrast, the world economy suffering this traumatic shock you can see here. We've indexed uh, global GDP back at 100 for a variety of markets. Look at the divergence in recoveries that we've seen across various regions. China made up almost all its losses in just one quarter. The rest of the world is going to take two to three years to recover at a very variable rate with UK and Japan down there at the lows. Uh, this, of course, has been complicated by the surge in infections from the new variations of the virus that we've seen in the UK and Europe. On the left here, I'm afraid the weekly confirmed cases per million people, shockingly high for the UK. US beginning to turn up again, uh, uh, rising pressure in Europe, but from a lower level. And that, of course, has prompted governments to tighten and lock down and take on the global stringency index. Remember, 100 is full lockdown, zero is the position pre-crisis, right back up to the 70s and 80s, the sort of levels that we saw back a, a year ago, almost in the spring of 2020. Three big events since we last spoke in the last three weeks, all of them broadly positive and broadly reflationary. One, the Oxford Astra vaccine has been released. Now, um, uh, Pfizer and Moderna certainly still the headlines, but if anything, I think this is even more significant. Principally because, not because it's its performance, which is not directly comparable with the others. It's been peer group review, it seemed reviewed. It seems to have a very high efficacy, with a 12-week interval, but important, it's cheap and robust and will be distributed to emerging markets at cost in perpetuity, a very powerful ingredient of a wider global recovery. To the US election of the Georgia state runoffs, Biden now has control of the Senate, the House, and of course, the White House through his administration. That means not that they'll just control the agenda, they'll be able to influence appointments, it's like that we get an additional stimulus package and we get a more aggressive infrastructure and tax and spend package going forward. Very powerful uptick for a recovery in 2021, but of course a potential threat to the bond markets. Thirdly, of course, we synced a Brexit deal. It was a thin deal as was expected, but it was a deal nevertheless, and it's a base to grow and negotiate from. We think it was broadly priced into sterling. I've showed there on the left of slide seven, the trade weighted pound, uh, broadly at the average levels we've seen since the Brexit vote back in 2016. Where I think it is a powerful force is beginning to bring some foreign flows back to unloved UK assets like the UK equity market, still 70% below the world equity markets since that 2016 vote. Put this together, and they were rocket fuel for markets since that uh, uh, end of the third quarter up until uh, last night's close. You can see those, those three triggers on the left of slide eight, the US election, the vaccine, and the Brexit deal, driving up the global equity index in blue up 
an almost incredible 19% for the FTSE All Share and for the emerging markets as those more cyclical markets began to perform. That reflationary impulse also reflecting commodities, copper up almost 20% more than gold over the quarter, and driving the dollar down, the dollar index falling to 89.8, imparting a reflationary pulse to the rest of the world economy. Finally, of course, this drove a surge in M&A after an extraordinary dry period in the first half of the year because, because of the vaccines. Volumes were only down 6% in total 2020 because of a huge surge in the second half. Just in the last month, S&P Global bought IHS Markets, AstraZeneca bought Alexium, Salesforce bought Slack Technologies. So there's green shoots beginning to emerge in terms of overall activity. So let's wrap this up on slide 10. The vaccine, of course, aids recovery prospects. Central banks are still highly supportive. And that new Biden stimulus flows into the US economy in mid-2021. That leaves us cautious on bonds, underweight governments, but now underweight corporates as well. Those spreads really have narrowed aggressively. In alternatives, we're neutral, uncorrelated alternatives, bringing back our gold positions, for example, but overweight other alternatives to capture that fiscal spend going into infrastructure and renewables. All this is funded by an underweight cash position. So I hope that gives you an idea of our positioning. We're aware, of course, of the risks, principally in the bond markets, but around about the 1% 10-year bond yield, trending perhaps up to 1.25, even 1.5%. We don't think there's pressure yet that's enough to derail that equity rally, which we see continuing well into the second quarter. Thank you.